Um, so we've, uh, Sharon himself, I've uh, taken out a bit of a, an interesting story over the years um, to give you the view from inner source to open source. But before I do that, um, to give you a, a quick bit of introductions, uh, just to make this work. Um, we're going to talk about the um, closing loop on um, inner so open source, back to inner source, and why companies want to do open source, and what inner source experience teaches us um, along that journey and how it can help us um, on that path to open source. Um, my name is Matt Cobby. I'm a director for um, Deloitte. I've been involved in inner source now for a few years. Um, I came to it through uh, basically trying to solve my own problems in my own context, in my own place, um, previously at National Australia Bank, where we were looking to find ways of reusing code across organizations to, for us to stop reinventing the wheel. Um, but I have over 18 years worth of transformational experience and underpinning all that is the fact that I like to help communities. Um, I like to help ultimately make the world a better place. And I find that in you know, is a great place to help companies um, make their worlds better and to, to share that across um, everyone here. Also, and to hand over to Mishari, you can introduce himself. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mishari Mukhtu. Mm -hmm. I am an, uh, an inner source coach. I also help companies with their with their open source workflows, um, as well as their, their remote work uh, projects. So uh, for me, I started off in, in the open source world uh, about 25 years ago. Um, and, and, installing Linux from, um, from floppy disks. And uh, having matured over the years, I, I have always found that there, there are two parallel tracks in the, in the technology world. One is the, the open source world, uh, the bazaar, if you, if you will. And the other one is the corporate, uh, the, 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 the cathedral, right? And, and, and uh, throughout my entire career, I have always, Look for opportunities of bringing across lessons learned uh, from the from the bazaar um, into into corporations, and I think that uh, over twenty years ago, this is often how we got Linux started. Right, this was through guerrilla attempts uh, at replacing uh, various servers uh, with Linux, just in order to stop them from crashing, and only months or years later management found out that we had uh, we had replaced everything with 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 open source and um, there's a, a, a there, and there's a certain uh, a certain way of of doing things so a few years ago i discovered inner source um uh, and i was happy to see that there is a community of people who are uh, taking open source principles and applying it to to organizations and so I, I jumped at the opportunity and I got involved in the community then. Uh, and also I, uh, I am a, a cacao farmer. So if you hear me uh, talk about uh, farm analogies a lot, that is why. Matt? Thank you very much. Um, I learned something I didn't know. I didn't know you were a cacao farmer. There you go. Bit of a difference to open source. So um, what did you think about, you know, what led us here was a conversation around, um, you know, the, the, the conflict between inner source and open source and what it takes to transition from one to the next and some of the paths and some of the techniques and what inner source can help along there. Um, I've been through my own journey through this and it didn't go as planned, but I learned some um, interesting things along the way and we made some, some interesting mistakes, um, which I can feed into some of this knowledge here. Um, but to kind of feed back onto that, you know, closing this loop, um, the idea is that, you know, we're presumably all reasonably familiar with open source communities, um, or also you know, everything we're, we're working here with today is built upon open source software. But there's, um, over the, you know, open source community has been around for a long time. Um, I was going reading as part of the preparation for this talk, I was reading through some of the history of open source, how it came about, and it was a very, you know, it was a very kind of messy origin from many different places. Um, you know, they had different aspects of um, pragmatism about it, sharing source code because that's how you had to compile the programs on your target platforms. You had the, the history of Unix and, you know, commercial um, licenses um, becoming a problem, obviously spawning off 
um, and Linux and others as, as well, but the operating systems. And so it's, you know, it's a history of something born out of necessity and about of, you know, that desire to um, ultimately make the world a better place. Um, I started my career in academia, where open source was, you know, very much a very core part of everything that we did. But looking back on the on the aspect of you know that relationship um, from open source and you know my entire career has been based on open source, we're using open source, um, and then the last few years we've been more involved in growing the concept of inner source in, in various different companies. The thing that we do see is quite successful there is, you know, the teams which are successful, the projects are successful around open source, um, are often successful around certain things um, in terms of governance. Uh, communication, common tools, and architecture. You know, with the governance aspect, you know, the decisions are typically are quite transparent between teams. They're open and consistent with the roles. Um, code reviews are taking place in the open. Um, uh, they look at, you know, the org structures are all quite, quite, quite an open and transparent construct there. With communications, you find that you know the, all the open source projects will work, possibly in the the true hybrid working way you know, before we had COVID, before we had the pandemic, and now hybrid working is, is, is something that we probably all are pretty much all doing. You know, open source projects were pioneering the way in terms of how do we work um, in terms asynchronously across time zones and across geographies. So there's a lot of good benefit there and a lot of lessons learned about how they work together. You know, how do you conduct you know, the code reviews when somebody's in a different continent, different time zone, different languages? There's a lot of practices there. And having a common set of tools, is, it's also been quite important. You know, when you're reaching across a great distance, you, you can't make assumptions about who's got on the receiving end. Um, you can't make assumptions that they have the same capacity. You know, they may not be privileged enough to have the same kit that you've got. And, and you have to be flexible with how people are working. And even in terms of the architecture, you know, their, their systems are architected awfully, ideally in a way which you can put together with components. Um, we've got, you know, some of the best open source software will have very clearly defined APIs, be very easy to consume and very easy to make a change on. Um, the architecture is easy to understand. You'll understand if it's a roadmap, perhaps, how that's going. So these are all, all things that we've seen and learned over the last, you know, three decades about, you know, how open source projects work quite well. Well, the question is, you know, how, how is this in relation from open source to open source? Well, we, we all know, and obviously here for a reason, that in source is the adaptation of open source practices and code um, on our internal systems and internal code bases. Uh, and we kind of go and think about, you know, why why do companies start, you know, in the source? Um, they're very different typically um, than an open source project and open source community. Um, it's quite, you know, I've, every large organization I've worked within, you know, it's predominantly covered in the, the silos um, and, you know, it's just that there are ways of working. Now, I, in some ways, I actually have a, over the years, I've changed my view on silos and I actually think that in some defense and some situations there's actually a case for silos to exist, but only when you have something like inner source to, to bridge some of the foundational elements between them. Um, enterprises often work with closed code bases. Um, I have, I have st stories about, um, common application in use and I had some spare time so I wanted to you know improve another application and I was quite rudely rejected because it was all closed and wasn't allowed access so you know there is that difference in closed open code the within a company your documentation tends to be functional it may be you know generated or based on very technical viewpoints but not understanding the foundational aspects of how you you build you know how you build the application and, and what's your developer experience across these um, unclear workflows are quite common in companies and certainly uncertain ownership. Um, even today, I've been talking to teams that don't, they use systems and they don't know who owns them. They can't work out who owns them. They know that they run. They know that they occasionally go down and somebody puts them back up, but they can't work out who runs them. So this, you know, the idea of um, uh, ownership is, 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 is a very important one. Um, Really, just kind of skipping through some of this, but it is again, this is you know, this is the reasons why we do you know, in source, and you start to see the similarity in dynamic between in source and open source techniques. After all, in source is just applying those um, techniques internally. 
you know, we've reduced some of those development silos where we have to, unintentional duplication um, with the shared components, we can speed up innovation. And, you know, it, it's looking at um, some of those intra-team dependencies. This is where it gets quite complicated when you've got team A building its application, but depends on the platform from team B as well. Uh, and, you know, generally it's, it's a good thing around employee uh, happiness. Um, currently doing some work around developer experience and end source is a key component of that. But the question is, you know, that's all great, but a company will take on a source and it's very clear and we, I think we here all understand why you want to do in a source and what the benefits of that are. But it's a bit more of an open question, especially for a, a company, but why you would choose to go to open source? You know, um, virtually every company out there will consume open source, but why would you take the extra step and go backwards? So with that, I'll hand it across to Mashari. He'll give us his view. Uh, thanks, Matt. So I, I tend to look at this from an, uh, an anti-fragile um, lens. So if you're not aware, anti-fragile is, is, is a term uh, coined or popularized by Nassim Nicholas Khaled, but he basically compares uh, two types of um, uh, two types of things, right? Uh, one is a is a coffee cup. A coffee cup. Uh, if you if you squeeze it, if you add stress, if you add pressure to it, at some point it cracks. But then if you have muscle, the more that you stress it, the uh, the stronger it gets. So muscle is anti uh, anti fragile, while a uh, while a teacup or a coffee cup uh, is not. So the idea is uh, through your journey towards. Uh, inner source, right? If you are doing things correctly and you and uh, you're doing things in an anti-fragile manner, as your team opens up, as you share more code, you should be able to see um, good things happening. You should be able to see a healthier culture. You should be uh, seeing more innovation happening to your code, uh, happening to your code or with your code. Um, you should also start seeing better abstraction, right? You should uh, be able to see. Uh, that your code is just tools, are just tools uh, that can be shared in, in, in other places. However, the part, the secret source that drives your business lies elsewhere. It lies in the operations, it lies in your relationships with your customers, um, et, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you should find uh, the burden being shared, people um, allowing, uh, trusting other contributors to come in and and, and work on your, on your code. You should also start seeing uh, rapid discovery and turnaround for, for uh, bug fixes. As the more eyes there are, the more scenarios under which your code is tested, the, more, the higher the chances of a bugs being discovered and, and, and squashed. Uh, the other thing is that even internally, um, you should uh, be seeing ecosystems around your, uh, your, uh, your stack. Uh, some classic examples of this are Ruby and Rails and Ansible. Uh, where you see uh, people using it, people creating blog posts, uh, events being organized, uh, documentation being being written, training programs uh, being done, etc. So this this entire uh, um, ecosystem, depending on the nature of your software, um, in a small scale or a large scale, uh, starts uh, starts coming up, and then that in turn uh, reduces the overhead for talent acquisition and training. So all this are benefits that you get. Uh, in inner source, but uh, but with a uh, with the lower intensity. If you're doing it right along this uh, this trajectory, the intensity will increase, and so all the benefits that you get will in turn increase as well. So um, some of the things that's required uh, to do open source well is one um, I, I've seen this before: um, open communication. Um, uh, companies have. Uh, there are several organizations that have decided to open open their code, but not open up their processes. So they're still having internal huddles about what changes to make, and those changes get push, pushed out to the open source projects, and the community gets upset uh, because they weren't consulted. So it's good to be able to um, make as much as many decisions as possible out there in, in the open and get feedback from the, from the community. The other part, of course, is the community as well. Uh, you should engage, you should respect, and you should trust them. So you should see yourself as part of the, the, uh, of the community. 
um, there should be an onboarding and mentoring process uh, that is solid uh, because as uh, Matt uh, touched upon this, you might be working with people uh, across the world um, who have uh, different cultural backgrounds, a different understanding. So your onboarding and mentoring process uh, should be solid to, to invite uh, people from uh, many different backgrounds uh, to your project. Um, you can also look through the uh, OSPO maturity model uh, in, in, in the link, uh, which will help you through the, through, through the journey and allows you to see uh, where you are. And of course, there's uh, metrics, uh, which as an organization, you, uh, you might consider having, so you can tell how your projects uh, are doing. The, the metrics really makes uh, management a lot easier. Thanks, Max. So these are just some uh, some some brief uh, slides. Uh, sorry, some brief uh, points. Uh, this is no means by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but the, these are some of the main um, points of uh, of differences between inner source and open source. And open source. I, I I like to think of it as a difference between an an intranet and uh, the 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 internet, right? So basically, um, there um, you open up your your, your communications. Uh, you write things more in the open. Um, there's a there's a question of uh, resource allocation. Um, who allocates the, the the resources and how? So whereas you have various internal teams, maybe it makes more sense to have an open source uh, pool from where uh, resources can be allocated. Abstraction uh, with inner source, it's important, but it's not so important because you can get away with having some highly proprietary uh, code floating around your company. But once it's out there, um, that's not possible. So you have to think a lot about how you are the abstraction of your code and, and what you release. Um, you also need to prepare your code um, again for, for many different scenarios, uh, not just your, your, your internal tooling um, and you, you and one thing that you can be start getting comfortable with is to make mistakes publicly uh, mistakes will happen there will be bad code being pushed out but the question is uh, how to deal with it uh, what to do about it I think it was uh, Robert Martin uh, Uncle Bob uh, uh, who once said I think it was him so one said that it's, it's better to have a, a, an imperfect system that you can change uh, compared to a perfect system that you cannot change. Because if you can change it, then, then it can get better over time. Well, but if it's fixed, then, uh, then, then you're basically stuck with that. Um, where it, internally, uh, there's a limited amount of help. Uh, for example, if you have an have a issue with a piece of code, you can only talk about it with people in, inside your organization. Um, but when it's outside, you can seek help from wherever it's appropriate. So an example is that I, I, I was uh, um, attending a presentation of a piece of, uh, of FinTech code that had been open source. And because I was in the audience at the time, I recognized that the, that the programmers had used the wrong hash function for, uh, for the code. And I corrected him. Right? I, I explained to him why this was an inappropriate hash function, but if I wasn't there, and they had only their own internal resources, possibly no one would have caught that. Uh, the next point is, uh, is the licensing. Uh, you need to think about this. You need to think about the force license. Uh, you need to think about the uh, contributor agreements, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All this may be not so necessary um, in an inner source, but then when the code is out there, um, it has to be clear. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. And so I think, you know, you, you've talked really well there about what the benefits are, you know, for companies to consider becoming open source. And, you know, you talked about the, the, that kind of extra muscle and the differentiality. And I think that that's the, that's the, the core of it. You know, it's how, how do you make the company, you know, a, you know, and your team stronger from, you know, also engaging in open source. That's the kind of, that's the why behind this. So the question is, if you're already doing it in a source and you're thinking about open source, then what, what does it teach you? Um, here we've got um it's really it's about but we're working through some of the things in a source it teaches you some of that resilience internally right 
you generally most companies will start from a fairly low base um, of you know skills or structure or how teams are working. But for a successful inner source uh, program to work, you've got to put some structure and um, ways of working around this as well. So you're going to work about how teams are working together. You've got to work out you know, how um, they clearly communicate with each other. You know, in terms of um, how the common um, sort of common point around engineering, for instance, as well. So some of the things, the techniques that we've used before have been around, you know, making sure your repositories are well structured, make sure they've got a consistent approach to them internally. This immediately puts your software code base into a better state for somebody to come understand it. This is a very similar problem from somebody from a different team coming to read your code base. It is from somebody from another country to come read your code base. You know, you have to improve your documentation, um, improve developer experience, because often internally in a company you'll find that the developer experience is quite poor. And that if you want to try and you know, build someone else's platform, you basically have to go on a full week of setting up a developer environment. The idea of these public roadmaps as well um, help stop some of the confusion you know, within the source that you, know, you don't want internal people making changes that there's not on the roadmap or not possible. Um, particularly, again, with the remote collaboration, you know, we're all hybrid now, so it's become quite, quite a thing. So again, using all these techniques, you know, I go back to and I'll point you back towards the inner source patterns book. Um, there's a lot of co core patterns there, which will help you in your inner source program. But you start to see if you start to map them back against the things that make op successful open source communities. There's a fairly good correlation there, because this is obviously inner source applying open source techniques internally. So by having your inner source, you know, program internally. And by getting using the, the the patterns available through the foundation, you can start to build up some of the resilience there um, that makes it easier for you to get in a place where actually your teams are already operating that way, and it could be quite a, an easy step to move into an open source uh, citizen. So you know, generally, the, you know, the, the the journeys will go something like this. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, everything will often start um, quite evolutionary. You find you know, the most successful programs are scratching a niche and fixing something that is a, is a problem in their um, current space. You know, there'll be a start with informal publishing, um, sharing of code between teams. Um, I've seen this happen a few times where actually in the, within the company, you might find this um, stage zero, you, you kind of, something kickstarts, and then it'll die off again, it'll kickstart and die again. And it will often take a number of iterations for it to catch. Um, Usually, ironically, because everyone's too busy to do anything about it. They're too busy to fix the problem, so they can be less busy, but they're too busy to fix the problem. So you, you end up in a bit of a vicious cycle, but you can start to break that. You know, you move on to the point where actually we're doing this a bit more than informally, and sharing, leaving bits of code on a, on a file share, perhaps, on a repo somewhere or different components. Someone hopefully has read, you know, about inner source. They've come up through one of these community calls, perhaps. It starts to, you know, if you use some of the patterns, pick some of those up. And with this, you start to get a bit more of the formal approach. You start to think about standardizing repositories, the readmes, the code owners. These are all the kind of tactical things you can do. Um, and you start to kind of build it out, and uh, you know, in source starts to scale. And this is probably the most difficult part of that of this journey, um, because you start to get on board, you get inflated expectations, and you're looking at what needs to happen. But then obviously you, go, you kind of build out, ideally you're building out some metrics to prove that actually the scales and this is worth it. And there's a whole other topic on in source metrics, you know, to show the value delivered through this. And, you know, how do you represent to your leadership that the in source is, is helping? You might deploy another in source um, foundation pattern there, the discovery portal to help with discovery. And finally, you might build into perhaps a dedicated team as well. But this is all kind of leading to that point again, where you start to go, actually, we're quite good at all these things, you know, around openness and governance and communication, collaboration and standardizing of tooling. It's like, well, actually, you know, we're doing a collaboration internally, but what everything we do is built on in source, um, open source software. So why don't we start contributing back? So this is the point here where you kind of start to learn some of these other techniques, you engage the legal team, you work out, you know, um, what it is around IP, um, what's the legal situation that your company is willing to do with, um, to Bashari's point earlier about the, 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 the open source licensing, you work out what's the appropriate open source license for your company. Um, you might even start funding people if you're in a lucky enough position and you've done the work on the metrics, you can start funding some people to make open source contributions back to the community. So you get into the, up these levels of maturity for your organization to the point where you can actually then start to say, well, actually, I've got something useful internally that we've built. 
that is also useful externally. Um, and I, you know, this is something which is a tool perhaps that is actually useful to someone else. Um, and then you can you know, work out, you've got the maturity now internally, the teams are trained, they understand it, your leadership and executive are on board with the inner source aspect because you can see the benefits of this. And it's not a big step to take then on to, actually let's publish this externally because of all the benefits that Mishari was talking about. Um, possibly the easiest one there is about, is about your, your brand as a company, as a tech company. Um, we publish open source software, we give back to the community. These are all things that help build your brand and help build, you know, that, that, that messaging and that storytelling about why somebody should come work for you. So there's a real natural link there about the discipline and rigor you put in around to your Angelos program through to feeding back to the community to, you know, actually publishing and becoming, uh, you know, adding to your corporate brand as well. So there's a lot there to do, I think, as you get through these stages of maturity that you can work your way through. Personally, I started this journey, I went from zero to, and then I went to one, and then I slept straight to five and then came back to two. So it's not always a linear journey. But just to finish up, um, I'll hand back to Mishari, you can talk about you know, what are some of the next steps you might think you want to take. So um, I, will, I, I, will, I will keep this short. Um, there are basically a bunch of guides where people uh, talk about this. Uh, much better than uh, than I ever can. So the to do group uh, is a fantastic place uh, to go for uh, OSPO or open source program offices. Um, with the um, OSPO checklist as well uh, for the Linux Foundation, and um, the OSPO zone. Um, these are the three uh, uh, best resources. I think that if you are uh, interested, uh, you can go there or you can come and hang out in the inner source comments and ask your questions, uh, ping me um, in the inner source comments Slack. That's also a, uh, a good place to talk about this. Um, everyone's journey will be different, right? As, as Matt said, I mean, yes, there, uh, there, there is a road which roughly tells you uh, where you are, but then, but then I think that your circumstances uh, will, uh, will define your journey, and I think that they can uh, uh, they can look very very different for each individual organization. So with that, we'll say thank you very much for the the formal presentation. Uh